Hey folks, it's Chris Thoreau here from Urban Micro and just want to do a quick introduction to our webinar uh, here on growing microgreens, continuing production in the light of COVID-19. Uh, we had some great attendance and some great questions and so we hope you find this uh, webinar useful in giving you some food for thought uh, in terms of how you can uh, continue production or whether you should shut down production. Uh, we covered a lot of stuff in this, in this uh, hour and 20 minutes or so, uh, and hopefully you find that useful. Uh, we tried to keep things very broad, and so I do uh, suggest that uh, uh, you not take anything uh, that we said too much to heart. We tried to cover things in a way that gave people some insights but in no way should be taken as advice in terms of what you should be doing um, for production to keep moving, uh, to keep in production. Uh, we are still waiting to get some guidelines from uh, health authorities in terms of uh, uh, measures that people can be taking in order to uh, maintain their production. Uh, though we hope for most microgreens producers, you're already uh, handling things in a way that keeps your food safe. So we hope you enjoy this webinar and uh, yeah, happy producing and stay healthy out there. And now I'm going to start the recording. <laughs> um, a great way for you to participate is to just at any time put your comments and questions into the chat window on any subject. Uh, we'll keep an eye on that and try to incorporate responses. Uh, but, uh, you know, we won't, may, may not get to everything, uh, but it just allows people to continue to, to put stuff in there um we'll try to get to that so you can ask questions you can make comments and uh that'll guide so we'll try to keep things uh topic specific and if we need to delve into something a little deeper deeper that's what we do uh, but hopefully we can cover a bunch of topics here that really sort of answer people's questions uh, about you know what they can do in terms of production through covid19 uh what not to do and and where we go from here yeah, thanks everybody for coming today. Appreciate it, and just want you to know that you know Chris and I wanted to do this to help. Uh, this isn't a, any sort of sales webinar or anything like that, so don't worry, you're not going to get sold anything except maybe sold some hope, which I think is good. Uh, the idea here is we're operating all under this same event. Whether you're in the restaurant industry, the food production industry, you're a retailer, you're a truck driver, a mechanic, it doesn't matter. Everybody's dealing with this. And I don't want to get too political into all of this. I'm going to try and stay away from that. The situation is what it is. A lot of this is beyond our control. And I know from talking with people on Instagram and reading a lot on Instagram, a lot of food producers are in really dire straits right now because the restaurant industry was a big customer for a lot of maybe you and for a lot of food producers out there. And overnight, you know, they've been switched off. And it's tough, but every producer is dealing with that. It's not just you. And, and I'm trying to look at this with, well, how can we come out of this better if that's what we want? So I'm approaching this with this whole idea of focus on what you can control versus what you can't control. You're not going to change this situation, but living under this, you can do some things to assess where you're at, get your business through this if you want, and then come out the other side stronger. Because I think at the end, when this is over, there will be opportunity because no doubt some companies will go away and people are going to want produce. And the restaurant industry is going to want to start back up again. And so do you want to participate in that? I think one thing all businesses really need to do to look at here is keep up morale. Once you start losing hope, once you start really giving up, you know, it, it's over. So you got to try and find things you can do despite all the negativity that might be surrounding your business, your customer base, find something to latch onto to stay positive, to say, I'm going to get through this. Especially if you have a crew, you know, what are you going to do with them? Is it laying them off? Are they going to reduce hours? How can people who maybe depend on you stay mentally engaged throughout this. You know, the world will exist after this. Restaurants will come back. Uh, I know that seems extreme now when a lot of restaurants have gone away and a lot of customers have been shut off, but they will come back. 
do you as a business want to be part of that when this is over? They're going to need produce again. They, I think the public will support a lot of local restaurants when this is over. And you can play a part in that. There's going to be a lot of businesses that shut down during all this. You know, do you want to be one of those businesses that shuts down? Maybe you do. I mean, I think some people could get to the end of the road here, or this might say, well, man, I haven't really been sure about this business all along. This is kind of a message from the gods to say it's over. But for other people who want to do this long term, like whether you like it or not, you have to find a way to navigate through this. And really, you got to ask, you know, is, is moving on your best option? Um, I don't want to compare a lot of people's livelihoods to what my kids go through, but my kids did some activities that all got shut off once this COVID-19 helped. And we were getting to the point where we were saying, you know, you're going to have to pick which activities you want to do going forward prior to COVID-19 because it's just too much. Well, they're forced to make this decision now. As I said earlier, if you're in a business and you're not in love with the business or there's certain crops you're not growing or certain customers you didn't like to deal with, certain market streams, certain parts of the business, well, now you're kind of being forced to realize those things. A lot of people get into microgreens as a side hustle, you know, something to do to bring a little bit of income. You know, is this what you want to do in the long term? I don't think there's anything bad about saying this isn't just for me. I mean, we've been dealt with this forced downtime. I think it's a good time to reflect. When you're doing that reflecting, you know, keep morale up by focusing on what you can do. There's something you can do now versus just being a pain taker, you know, an economic business suffering taker. There are things you can do to contribute to your business in your community and in your life and maybe your families. So it doesn't have to be just this bad scenario. Um, you know, we sell to the farm industry. Like I'm, I feel a lot of the pain that a lot of growers grow th go through in a different way, kind of I'm once removed from it, but I see a lot of that pain. And there are things that, you know, we're trying to do to help and to ensure that when everything comes back, you know, we're around. Group up. I, I think there's a lot of people who might feel isolated if their businesses have been turned into disaster zones. Well, there's a lot of microgreen producers out there like this. You know, is anybody networking with others? Find people in your similar situation coming from a different place. What are they doing? How are they going to come back at the end of this? I think strategizing with others in a similar situation now is really beneficial and, and stay active. Like don't, it, it can't just be woe is me, give up. There's always something you can do within your business if you do want to keep it going. But I think keeping up morale during times like this is really important. So maybe add a quick, uh, a couple quick comments here. A uh, great comment from Martin about producing. So curious about uh, uh, where people are at in terms of where does microgreens factor into your income? Uh, are you a sole income earner from microgreens or is it just one of, of many sources of income you have? So anything you can just uh, put through on the chat regarding that would be really um, valuable. Uh, I know seeing some of the Facebook posts uh, recently about people who are taking this time to do a bit more experimenting with crops and things like that as well. So yeah, it'd be great to, to, to have you guys uh, sort of chat in a little bit about uh, how, how this is affecting your income, whether this is your sole source or uh, one of many. Uh, while, you're, uh, while you're putting that in, uh, Jacob, do you want to make a quick comment there on income? Yeah, sure. Um, so I recently, <laughs> uh, timing was pretty bad, but uh, I essentially gave a notice and resigned at my full-time job uh, <laughs> ending as of uh, yesterday. So that was uh, unfortunately poor timing, but um, nothing you can really do. Um, and I, since I resigned and wasn't laid off, I can't even uh, technically claim EI. So, um, you know, I've got a, I can't really slow down with the micros now. This is, uh, you know, I, I had a part-time job set up at a restaurant, which is also closed indefinitely. So uh, for the moment, microgreens is my only income. 
And um, I think just like we're seeing um, outside of the microgreens industry and in general, uh, now is the time to get creative. Now is the time to pivot. Now is the time to uh, rethink things. And there's, I think there's plenty of opportunity for microgreens growers. Um, uh, obviously, if you focused solely on restaurants uh, as your as your market, uh, that's going to be uh, essentially uh, done for for the time being. Although lots of restaurants are still offering takeout, so there may still be some uh, some viability there. But uh, um, I know for myself at least, uh, I I just put up one post on Facebook saying that you know I had all this uh, all these orders that were supposed to be for restaurants and within a few hours i had sold out of everything just from my network and people sharing that from from one facebook post um so i i think at a time when people are worried about where food is going to be coming from it's great to be a local food producer um, people are going to want that and uh yeah like martin said you know and i've seen other people another uh, sprouted earth in toronto did the same thing she posted up and sold out of everything so people want to support small local business people want healthy uh, nutritious food especially at this time although you have to be careful with how you're advertising it but um and then you know if you can get into some grocery stores small independent grocers have been great for me uh, and uh yeah i think it's it, and like you said, you know, it's a great time to experiment as well. Uh, right, and I, I think you're dead on there with everything, and it's it's taking advantage. I don't mean that in an exploitive way, but I mean it, it is the situation it is, and there are opportunities out there to try and solve some of these food insecurity concerns that people have in a positive way, not in an exploitive way. I think, you know, the finance side, looking at this from everybody else is, it looks like a lot of people were kind of part-time um, with a couple full-times. And I look at this from a finance standpoint of, given that a lot of business revenue may have gone down for a lot of people, it comes down to, you got to take stock of where is, where's everybody at financially? Um, because if you can't survive through this COVID-19 Financially, it doesn't matter what you do beyond this. And I think a lot of businesses, not necessarily in this space, but have gotten way too far ahead of themselves with credit and not enough cash on hand, that it can be really dangerous when sales go down by 90%, you're stuck. So I would suggest to everybody in here, look at where you're at financially, both on the personal side and the business side. What are your upcoming expenses? What do they look like? Where's that going to come from? And then how much cash do you have? Is that going to last you out? You know, if you don't have to buy anything during this period, don't be buying it. There's not the time to expand in this point. Um, and Chris, let me know that, you know, a lot of Canadian government agencies have started to introduce programs where people can go for aid. I think the U S government is going to turn on that machine as well. And there will be a lot of opportunities for small businesses to get involved in that government assistance. So, it looks bleak now, but preparing for that, knowing that it might be coming, being financially conservative now is, I think, a big way to help. Yeah, there are some programs being set up here in Canada, I would assume in the U.S., in other words, that so far I think are doing a really good job of recognizing not only that people are going to lose their work, because we often think about employees losing their job and collecting EI and what that looks like. But a lot of people are self-employed. A lot of people are not working. Um, in Canada, there's even funding right now for um, people who are in, in um, uh, abusive or dangerous households that they've got specific funding for. So it, it's amazing uh, the breadth of which funding is looking at right now. So I think it's really important to keep up with, with uh, what kind of financial supports might be out there as a business owner, for your staff, for you to subsidize uh, uh, wages and things like that, uh, because you want to capitalize on everything that you can, even if you're well buffered, even if you've got a, a good resilient business plan and good business model, you're going to be hit. So it'll be good to take advantage of that stuff. And uh, through social media, I'll do my best to share some of that information as it, uh, as it comes uh, more available. Yeah, and the big question that comes up, and I've kind of been reading through the comments here is, 
and this is my next point is, you know, can you produce and sell some product? There's a lot of people, and I've seen this on Instagram, they'll say 90% of my business was restaurants, 99% of my business is restaurants. They're gone. Like, I don't think there's any hiding from that. There's no sugarcoating it. The question is, what do you do now? Is there any other way to tap in? Um, like he was saying earlier, can you post on social media? Can you try and sell within a network? It's, I don't think there's going to be an easy solution, but the solutions are going to have to be creative and, and you're going to have to try a bunch of things knowing that most of them aren't going to work instead of just potentially waiting this out for the restaurant industry to come back online. Obviously, you want to defer to what local health authorities are saying to do. If they're saying don't produce, well, you can't produce. But if they're not shutting you down and you want to stay in business, how can you sell? And I think there are a lot of producers, pop-up markets at different places and doing home delivery, people setting up online stores that they're not easy. They're not all going to work in every location, but maybe there are things that you could do there while we can still get around. Um, you know, Maybe produce I'll for yourself. Chris brought this up too. You know, you, a lot of microgreen producers, you're going to have a bunch of product on hand that you can produce. You can produce for yourself. You can start testing varieties, looking at timing, trying new things, whatever you have, but saving some money for yourself and maybe for your neighbors is one way to at least stay engaged and be like, Hey, I'm, I'm still doing something here. Even if sales are low. I'll maybe make a, just a, a little comment here. Uh, following up on Martin's comment, we're seeing a lot of hoarding. Uh, the, the news has been hoarding on toilet paper, but I know the seed companies have been, um, really, really busy because people are buying up the seed. Uh, this, I think this will be something we can talk about a little later in the webinar, but one of the challenges is, uh, you know, I'm set up to produce here at home. I can produce, uh, I have enough seed right now to produce a couple trays of microgreens for a couple of months. But uh, after that, what would I do if that seed isn't available? So we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, but yeah, good, good at adapting there. Um. You know, Adam left the comment in here about concern over contracting the virus, being asymptomatic, distributing product, potentially contaminated. You know, I don't know how to answer that other than saying you got to go with what health authorities are saying. Um, so, so I know in our notes, Diego, we had kind of looked into talking about this stuff a little bit later. Um, so, so we can get into the stuff. I think we would like to talk a little bit about what production looks like. We're not going to get into any how-to stuff, but I think um, uh, there's a few things we just want to keep going through here, just some contextual stuff, and then we'll get into the production side if people are, are, are okay with that, because these are really, uh, really important questions to be asking. Yeah, so you know, a lot of people going into this, a lot of customers are restaurants, farmers markets being shut down. You know, your, what are your solutions? What are your choices there? One, just you wait it out, and see when they all come back, and maybe you can get back to that business. Or the other way is you're going to have to try and connect with some of those customers or make new customers and, and get creative to get them product, reinvent the business. I, I think this has been a wake up call for a lot of people, even with what we're doing with our online store of just trying to say like, how could we change this up a little bit for if something like this ever happens? But I think there's no better time to start now, not that you have to launch those sales now, but at least getting processes in place, being familiar with them is really important. Um, the other thing I think people can do a lot of now is repairs and improvement is what I would call that. Just start looking at, work that can help you move towards a better future in your business that maybe you otherwise wouldn't have time to do. Repairs, upgrading things, moving around your work system, testing out processes. Well, if I did this before I did this, would it make things faster? During the heat of the season when you're busy, a lot of those things can't happen. Maybe you can knock them out now. A lot of those things won't require you to spend money. If you did have employees and you're keeping them on hand, Make sure everybody now is cross-trained in case someone gets sick, in case something happens. Can everybody do everything? If they couldn't before, now is a time to teach them. If you ever wanted to write down written procedures, make any sort of manuals. If you're looking at 
getting sort of HACCP certification. Why not start looking into that now? There's going to be, there was government grants out there. There will probably be more government grants out there. You could start looking into those things. Uh, In-house growth trials, that website you've been wanting to update forever. Now's the time to do it. The online store you've been wanting to make forever. Now's the time to do it. Look at what's gone well with the business, what hasn't up till now, how can you change those things? So I think it's just a time to reflect. Again, it's, it's a tough situation, but sitting here doing nothing, not everybody's doing that. And there will be strong businesses that come out of this on the backside that have used a lot of this time to position themselves well so when this is over, they can do well versus just kind of giving up. Yeah, deep cleans, great time to test. Um, but I think it's, it's interesting, you know, a lot of creativity is going to come out of this. I, I almost wonder how much people's buying habits are going to change. And you're seeing a lot of farmers markets now go to pre-orders where customers have to pre-order from their farmer, just go to the farmer's market and pick it up. And in a way, I think that's more convenient than just leisurely shopping, maybe not as fun for some people. But I wonder if some of these buying habits that we're being forced to use now will stick past this. And if it's good just to look at furthering this beyond this whole COVID crisis when it is over. Yeah, these are some, I think there's some great points, um, Diego, in terms of how we look at how we get food to people and how people get food from us. Uh, and I think the question here, I think a lot of growers are asking is, um, people still need to get food and with the shift, how is the best way for my product to get to them? And there has been, uh, I think the three things that have come up more than anything, uh, because people are seeing a big shutdown with farmers markets is CSAs. And that's people starting their own microgreen CSA. I know, I know Jacob, you've talked about that. Uh, farmers market, like if your farmers market is up and running uh, and you're not sure if you should be producing or not, well, that's that's a little bit of authority for you to be producing because they still want people coming and selling and then shifting to home delivery. Uh, depending on what your customer base looks like, you may have customers that have been regularly buying from you directly that you can continue, continue to sell to or customers who know your products from the local grocery stores. And if for some reason you're, you're not able to supply those grocers, you can start to do home deliveries. So these things are, are, can be, can be uh, quite challenging. I don't mean to gloss over them, but there, I think uh, there are ways that you can adapt. Um, I'd love to shift into, and, and people can keep um, making comments into here in terms of what production looks like and what are some of the things we should be considering with production um, as we do that. So just, is there anything else you wanted to add, Diego, before I get into that? No, that's it. You could run with it. Yeah, so, so I think the, the one thing I want to start with is, is the question of, should I still be producing at all from a health and safety point of view? This is something I've seen on a lot of Facebook posts. I've been getting a lot of emails and especially a lot more with, um, with the announcement of this webinar. Um, and and I'll, 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 I'll try to make this long answer very, very brief. Um, in my opinion, if you are producing microgreens already, uh, you should already be producing in a way that takes something like COVID-19 into consideration. You should already have very, very good handling health and safety procedures in place. Uh, Jacob, uh, we've, we've been doing a little bit of emailing and, and messaging back about uh, standard operating procedures. Um, this was the first thing I did in my microgreens business was develop standard operating procedures. And what standard operating procedures are, are all the steps you take to produce your product at different stages. And a more advanced uh, aspect of standard opera operating procedures is um, HACCP principles or hazardous analysis and critical control points. And what this means is you analyze your system and you look at all the points along the production process in which contamination might occur. Now, when we're talking about microgreens, we're looking at 
when that could happen with seed, when that could happen with soil, when that could happen during harvest from, from human contamination. There's all these different points at which that could occur that I really hope you all are already doing. And I know you're all gonna be doing that to different degrees, and this is just me trying to push you along the spectrum. Um, and this is the sort of event that pushes us along that spectrum. And for those of you who are already doing this well, what it just means is tightening things up a little bit and, and, and doing what you're already doing and, and, and making sure you're doing it well. Um, where things shift a little bit here is um, you are, it's, it's not so much the risk of uh, a pathogen like E. coli or salmonella or listeria in the product itself, but now there's this virus that could live on the packaging or on the box or on a door handle that you could transfer it during delivery in a way that's a little different. So this is something that's really, really important to take into consideration um, if you do want to continue um, operating. So uh, with, for, at the risk of talking a little too much, uh, I'd love to hear people type some stuff into the chat box if you have any thoughts about that. Um, there's a few things uh, to consider here though. Uh, number one, if you have any symptoms of coughing, sneezing, fever, any COVID symptoms, you need to stop producing right now. Um, and if you ever have those symptoms, you shouldn't be producing. You should be always uh, eliminating yourself from the workplace in that scenario. That's standard practice already. And in this case, it's in particular. So in that case, you're shut down for weeks at least. You need to make sure that your symptoms have abated and you are, you're not just a, uh, past it, but you are not infectious anymore. Um, that is, that is um, really important. Now, I was talking uh, to Shauna from the Food Peddlers, who's here, and I might put on the spot a little bit later. Um, you know, their crew is relatively healthy, but, you know, about a week before the outbreak, somebody did visit them uh, at the site who, who might have been sick and they didn't have COVID-19, but it just brought up this idea of who have we been in contact with as producers, as a business, what could we have brought back into our system unknowingly, and, and what do we do in that situation to make sure we're, um, we're safe. So there's still information coming out uh, about the, this virus's ability to survive on surfaces, uh, everything from several hours to several days. So we need to assume at this point that the virus can live on a surface for several days. So keep that in mind in terms of things you need to consider in terms of best practices or standard operating procedures um, when doing deliveries. So I just wanna, I'm seeing a few things uh, coming up here. I'd love to hear other our thoughts on this. In terms of insurance, you know, you should be asking this of your insurance company. Um, ignorance in most cases is not a defense. Uh, so if you don't know something and something happens, you're still liable. You know, if you didn't know as a restaurant, you had to have uh, a dishwashing machine that got to, you know, 70 degrees Celsius for 30 seconds, it was your responsibility to find that information out as a producer. So, uh, but if you do know something and you don't do anything about it, that's negligence. So in this situation, I think the key thing here is doing your due diligence. So in talking with Shauna at the Food Peddlers, we had a really long conversation about, you know, do we put, we need to think about the economics of our business. We also need to think about the health of, of the people we serve. And what does this look like? And through conversation, um, the, the other thing that came up was the stress and anxiety that it causes business owners and workers. And because that was pretty high, that was actually a good reason for the food peddlers to step back from production. And now I know they're looking at, okay, well, how can we get back into production in a way that makes sense in this new scenario and hopefully can work something out to get some product out there. So um, finding ways to adapt to that uh, is really, really important just sort of reading some comments there. Um, I have other people, are there people here who have shut down their operations completely because they are unsure about what to do? Yeah, so Brandon, yeah, I saw your comments earlier, saw that you had sh shut down as well, yeah. And, and these are, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'll have to say at this moment, I'm one of the privileged. I'm working for a university right now. It's only part-time, but I can work from home. 
as a producer, I'd be trying to look for ways to continue producing. Um, but uh, it would be a matter of um, really how to do that safely. Um, so one of the things I want to uh, acknowledge here is, so I, I cannot give you advice on what to do. I do not know what should be done yet. Uh, I did uh, send some Facebook messages out today to the Canadian uh, Federation of Agriculture, to the USDA, the CFIA, uh, our own ministry. Uh, I happen to know the Minister uh, of Agriculture here, uh, the National Farmers Union in Canada and the United States, because a good place to start is to know like, what are the experts saying? And how can we build on that? Um, one thing I, 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 I would be doing myself is starting to document what we're doing. Restaurants have, have shut down, so we're not delivering to restaurants. You know, uh, this has happened, so we're not going to do this. But here is what we are going to do. Uh, we're going to do, as, as Jacob commented on earlier, we're going to do a deep clean. We're just going to clean everything. We're going to limit deliveries to certain types of customers. Uh, we're going to we're going to change our handling procedures. So if you're documenting the steps you're taking and you're drawing from existing uh, guidelines to do that, you're putting yourself in a in a better position to make sure you're not a vector for for the virus, and to sort of address Martin's problem, you're you're protecting yourself from liability. Because the challenge here is how do you continue to contribute as a, as a food grower to the, this absolute need of people without putting those people at risk? And it's a very, very difficult uh, question to answer. So where I would like to start from is getting some guidance from the authorities that we can build on and uh, taking a precautionary approach and then getting a sense of how we can build on that. So hearing some, some thoughts from you guys about what you're doing, um, uh, would be really, really uh, interesting. And what we might be able to do is start to build some uh, best practices that we can share with others and can continue to adjust, just like we're hearing about social isolation and self-isolation changing every day in the news, we can be adapting on a day-to-day -day basis by using these technologies to stay in contact with each other as a community of growers. And I'm actually really excited to see, I, I know we have a mainly North American audience here, but seeing people in Germany and Czech Republic who are going through these same things and hopefully um, that we can uh, you know, do this together to, to find some solutions. Hello in France. Okay, so I need to stop talking. <laughs> so do you have some thoughts to add, uh, Diego, or, or is there uh, some other folks that um, building on that about, and staying on the topic of should you be, be producing at all? Is there other things that people are taking into consideration um, that I haven't talked about that, uh, that, that others should consider? So I see a lot of people doing the deep clean, which is great. There is a raise hand feature, um, but if people do want to uh, say something through audio, uh, um, please go ahead. Uh, I know there's a, a lot of expertise in the room here, so. Come on, people, I can't do all the talking. Well, I can, but uh, I shouldn't. <laughs> okay, so in, in terms of just getting rid of this uncomfortable silence, um, the next thing that was on my list of things to talk about, actually, I'm gonna, gonna go into details a little bit more about standard operating procedures. So your standard operating procedures, as I mentioned, are the specific steps you take uh, at various points in your production to bring your, your, your product to, 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 to fruition. It, it comes with receiving and storing seeds, uh, how you do your tray prep, how you do your soaking and sewing and sanitizing, your uncovering. At every stage, there should be a very specific thing you do and that everybody should essentially be doing it the same. And one of the reasons standard operating procedures are really good is because number one, it's a really effective way to train people. 
So when people come on board, you're making sure that everybody's doing the exact same thing. And if people aren't doing the same thing, it's really, really hard to tell when something goes wrong, why it went wrong. So but by having the standard operating procedure, which is very modern and McDonald's-like, uh, it has its advantage in terms of accountability and consistency. Because the consistency is good because if you're getting some good yields and some bad yields and some disease and some not diseased all the time and you're all over the place, it's very difficult to manage. So by, by standardizing things to a method that works, it's, it's going to benefit you, you quite a bit. Um, as part of that process, you need to really understand where your risk of contamination is during production. So here, you want to think about during production to avoid human pathogens, but now you want to shift that over to how do you avoid that in getting the product from you to the customer where, while that action is potentially a, uh, an opportunity to be a vector for the disease, especially if you are, 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 are asymptomatic. Symptoms may not show up for a week or two, so you could be spreading this virus unknowingly for a very long time. And as a food producer, as an individual who's going out to several individuals to deliver them food, you're a very good vector. So uh, keeping, keeping that in mind and looking at your operation, I think is really, really crucial. So where I'd like to shift to a little bit is over to the idea of farmer's markets because farmer's markets are still running. Farmers markets here in British Columbia, they're looking at on a week to week basis, but they're maintaining them because they are food access points. And I got an email from my farmers market yesterday just laying out all the things they're doing. So farmers markets now only have farmers. There's no craft people. There's no prepared food. So as you can imagine, one of the things that does is it opens up a lot of space. So that allows the uh, vendors to spread out. Nobody is allowed to do any sampling. Um, people are, are actually recommended to follow a specific route, go in and around the market, and then leave. And within uh, certain areas, there can only be so many people within a certain zone at any, good time, at any given time. So this, I think, is a really good effort that the Farmers Market Society is doing here to keep things going. And in places uh, in Ontario, maybe in Quebec as well, where uh, and other places where you're seeing farmers markets being closed down, here's a chance maybe for you as a producer to say like, hey, other markets are, are, are operating elsewhere. Can we find a way to do this too? Partially it's economic, but partially it is we, we have a role to play here. We, have, we can contribute to this situation by getting food to people. So um, using some of these practices are ways of hopefully improving the situation there. Now, as a microgreens producer, then it comes, becomes also, as any producer, as a vendor at that market, if you do have a market, now how do you handle things uh, to make sure you're not a vector in any, uh, in any way? And once again, ideally, you should already be acting as if this is the case when you were at the farmer's market. Um, so for the food peddlers at the farmer's market, we, we do package to order at the farmer's market. Um, but there's a lot of hand washing, a lot of hand sanitizing. Uh, if you any time you touch money, you need to wash and sanitize your hands. Uh, so there's a bunch of protocol in place already, which would increase in this situation. So one thing would be to... Um, have two people at the market. One person handles product, one person handles money. So one person is interacting with the, the, the customers and one person is interacting with your product. So you can separate those things a little bit. You would still have a hand washing and hand, sanitize, hand sanitizing stuff on hand. Um, the other thing is if you tend to, to pack to order at the market, you're probably better off pre-packaging at your site and bringing everything pre-packaged. That way you're doing less handling of product overall um, and, and there's less risk of, of just some sort of cross-contamination happening there. Um, other than that, you're going to continue to follow farmers market protocols that are already in place in order to, um, in order to make sure you're, you're reducing your risk as a vector. Um, so I've seen a few comments here about people whose, whose farmers markets have been shut down. Are there people um, that are still at a farmer's market where their farmer's market is still operating and they have attended that farmer's market? Um, Shauna, I know you're here and I know you may not want to speak, but I'd be curious to know if, uh, 
if the food peddlers has been to a farmer's market uh, in the past few weeks and what are some things you've done or what are some things the market has done there that your um, that uh, affected things with production for you or uh, selling for you guys uh, and then others yeah if you've been at the farmer's market what does it look like um, do you feel comfortable being at the farmer's market selling your product even with all these precautions in place are you still feeling that there's a risk of you being a vector uh, in, in that situation i'm going to just take another talking break here so martin you shifted to pre-packaging then eh? as opposed to packing at the market does that make you feel a little bit better about just things in general? Yeah, it's a little bit more work. One of the reasons we pack at the market is because otherwise you just spend most of your time standing around doing nothing. And pre-packaging in the market adds an extra cost. So the nice thing about it usually is it gives you some flexibility. Um, but so this may add some extra cost, but it may keep your sales up. So um, the good approach. Um, have other people here and i've seen the questions on 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 facebook and other forums how many people have looked at uh starting a microgreen csa so a prepaid or even pay as you go delivery system and have any has anybody shifted to either increasing home delivery or adding home delivery when that's something you haven't done before so is a is that is that a request to to, to turn your microphone on there uh, jacob <laughs> Yeah, go ahead if you want, because I know I have seen you post a few things online uh, about uh, making some adjustments there. So just uh, maybe curious about some of the stuff you've done. And it would be great to hear uh, some other folks in, in here as well. So yeah, go ahead, Jacob. Oh, hold on. Yeah, I got it. So uh, just really quickly, um, you know, I did uh, add a subscription service page to my website. I have found it difficult to get traction. Um, you know, I put up some posters at like local yoga studios and stuff like that. Uh, I'm finding social media is a much better way to get the word out there than uh, to try and get people to come to my website and sign up. But one thing I, I just posted a comment and uh, I don't know how common this is, but we have um, different services in, in our area, uh, stuff like uh, Fresh City Farms and uh, in, in Guelph where I am, um, Home Field, and they basically do like organic food delivery they act essentially as a csa but they act as a hub and people can go on their website and order stuff it's all from local farms and then that just gets dropped off at people's door so seeing if there's uh businesses like that in your area and if they're willing to carry your product could could be a great option now so this is a good i like this idea now would you as a as a producer selling to that business be asking that questions that business additional questions about their handling and what they're doing to step up things for me once the product has left my hands the liability is also uh, left my hands right so i'm doing my best to follow my procedures and and make sure that i'm delivering a a, a sanitary product um after that it's it's really to me it's it's up to them because i don't know what products they have, how they're working with that. Obviously, I'm concerned about it, but I would, you know, I would hope that uh, any business that's doing that is is taking similar precautions. Yeah, yeah, that's a good good way to look at it. Um, I wonder if, if if any of the folks joining us from uh, Europe have any comments on this. Uh, I know things have been pretty intense there. The situation in Italy has been a, a focal point on the news here, as I'm sure it is there. Um, I, I'd be curious to to know if that's been something that's been talked about there, or how you're how you're dealing with things there. So I just had to knock a cat off a table there. Uh, if you if you don't once again, if no someone doesn't feel like uh, talking, you could definitely type something in. Um, I don't know about you all, but I get sick of hearing the sound of my own voice pretty quickly. So I do like to hear from others. So, so I, a few people, uh, Brandon mentioned wanting to do some home delivery. I know uh, the food peddlers does home delivery has always done that. It may be able to step that up. Um, the CSA, I, I think the CSA option is something people are often interested in. 
And I think the challenge with a, C, a microgreen CSA is you have this limitation in products. You're not doing, you know, potatoes and celery and stuff that shifts throughout the year. It's always microgreens. And some people are interested in that, uh, which is great. Um, would love to hear, um, uh, <laughs> uh, would love to hear um, uh, just anything that people are doing to sort of adjust in that. You know, Diego made this point earlier of like, how do you pivot here and rethink your business model um, and, and, and just, uh, you know, adapt. And I think some people are thinking about this already. And, and, and just to go back to what Diego said earlier, like this is unprecedented and you could have all the safeguards in place you want for this type of business. And, you know, if, if, if your customers all close down and the government says you can't go outside, there's very little you can do, but where you can do something, the reason, again, why we wanted to do this webinar is because as food producers, if you can do something, it's, it's a really good opportunity to be contributing to, to what's happening here. And, um, I, you know, just getting input from people in terms of what they're doing uh, is really valuable. So I see some comments coming on there, uh, which is good. Um, yeah, so Catherine asked the, yeah. So, um, you know, one thing I was thinking about in terms of delivery, if, if we're seeing that we know the, uh, the, the time that the virus can be on uh, a product or on a surface, uh, what kind of advice we can give people before they open a package? You know, how long do these microgreens need to sit in your fridge before you eat them? Um, so the, these are questions I think that are still need to be asked. And I think, uh, by keeping up to date on the news and what's going on out there. Like I said, I threw a bunch of questions out to authorities and being Saturday, I don't expect to hear back, but I might follow up during the week to get a sense of uh, what are the uh, at least original suggestions that we can work with uh, as microgreens producers and in particular smaller scale uh, microgreens producers. It's a very um, unique situation. And so some guidelines would be very valuable. So. Uh, just looking at some of the comments here. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. Um, so I'm just moving down. Can, continue to put questions in there. We just have a list of things that we want to cover. We're about 45 minutes in. We've actually covered a lot, and I, I really appreciate the comments um, people are making. They've been very valuable. Uh, just checking. I actually sent a message to our Minister of Agriculture hoping she could join us today, uh, but I haven't heard from her, so uh, that's not likely to happen. That's okay. Um, the I'm just looking at my list here. Um, so another topic um, I've seen and has come up here already is, is access to seeds. Um, seed companies, I know not just microgreen seed companies, but vegetable seed companies have been very busy. Uh, orders are getting behind because so many are coming in. You can see people are planning for this to be drawn out, and I think seed is a good investment. Um, are people in a situation where they're realizing there is product they could be growing, but they, they're short on seed or are about to run out of seed or can't access seed? And then I have to wonder, um, are there situations where somebody actually has, uh, you know, so the food peddlers buys, uh, and I'm not putting the food peddlers in the spot here, the food peddlers, we often buy uh, seed by the pallet. We buy a year's worth of seed. And um, if, it's, if people are, are in desperate need of seed and people have seed they can spare, are people willing to maybe ship a, a 10 kilogram bag of a sunflower seed across the country to someone who maybe needs it for a couple weeks of production? Um, what do people think about what to do about seed if it becomes scarce? I mean, Chris, you know this, what's, seed is not like medical masks or coronavirus test kits that you can just bring online. If all of the current seed supply was absorbed up, how does supply get back into the hands of the seed distributors? Like, what does that timeline look like? So it's, it's a very complicated question and answer. So certain seed has very specific seasons. And so it's gonna be, they're produced in very specific parts of the world at very specific times of the year. 
they go through production, harvesting, processing, then they might go through a few distributors before they get to the final uh, sort of place like Mums or True Leaf that sends it out to the consumer. So some stuff uh, is produced all over the place and, and, and there's, there's different seasons that come in all the time uh, and other stuff that's gonna come in uh, just at one point. Uh, so I know like this is the time of year now where moms are starting to get stock of a lot of stuff. I think uh, uh, stuff that's been through like uh, fall harvest, processing, distribution, testing, and it takes this long to get some of the fall harvest to market. So some stuff is going to be like it's come and it's gone and that's it until next year. Uh, in other cases, it's going to be like a continuation of lots coming in. Now, sometimes you've got uh, producers that are growing seeds specifically for microgreens production. Uh, so it goes, it goes through the system, it goes through the distributors, and then, and then it gets put out. Um, now, black oil sunflower seeds are named oil sunflower seeds for a reason, is they primarily end up in the oil market. Now, there could be cases where uh, there's a, a large lot of sunflower seed ready to go to the oil market and for some reason it can't get to that market anymore. An order's canceled, it doesn't meet an oil um, uh, content standard, and so that gets diverted to, to, to other uses, which might be bird seed or it might be um, microgreens use if it's been handled in a way that allows it to be um, still uh, available for human consumptions. So in th that case, and, and for those of you who are ordering seed regularly, you often will, will hear your producer saying, oh, we've got a new lot coming in of this. Like sunflower, as an example, there'll be three or four lots that come in during a year, maybe even more than that. So it's going to vary uh, a lot by seed. Uh, as I talk about a lot in these webinars and other things, you should be in constant, constant contact with your seed producers or uh, suppliers, keeping up to date on how much of their current stock they have, when they're expecting their next lot in. Once again, these are exceptional circumstances and uh, there's going to be a lot of unknowns. But some of these uh, companies like Mums or Truly for even Johnny's might be able to say to you, like, we've got a good stock of this. Uh, like you're seeing in some of the, the retail stores, they may limit how much they send out to companies. You know, maybe instead of buying pallet loads, we can only buy 100 kilograms at a time instead of 750 kilograms of some seed. Um, so your shipping costs are going to go up on, on a, a, a per unit basis. But uh, once again, uh, what I like about that is everybody's getting a bit of seed. And we, when we look at things through a resilience lens and how do we all get through this as opposed to the uh, how is my business going to survive, hopefully this distribution of stuff amongst many producers helps everybody out and we can weather things long enough where um, the seed supply remains stable. Um, there were concerns here in Canada, for example, uh, we use a lot of temporary foreign workers in agriculture. And for the original uh, border closures, that included temporary foreign workers. And a lot of the farmers said, like, if we don't have these workers, we cannot produce crops. And so there's things happening now that could have severe consequences a little ways down the line. And that could include seed production. And this might be an, an issue in Italy where they're, they're in lockdown and Italy produces hundreds of millions of dollars worth of seed, uh, of euros worth of seed every year. So uh, Canada has actually changed its, its regulations to let uh, temporary foreign workers in because they know their jobs already. They're actually very well trained and they're very specialized. So that's gonna allow things to continue in that regard. So there, there may be something that things happening now that we're gonna actually uh, not see the consequences until next season's uh, seed ordering comes up. So yeah, if you get the chance, um, trying, to, trying to get in touch with your seed companies, checking out their websites, uh, phone calls might be tough these days, but uh, any information you can get. And if you do get, please share with others to get a sense of what we can expect, what the best way to prepare is, um, and what we, what we can uh, uh, expect in terms of shipping dates, volume, things like that, because there's still a lot of unknowns there. And it sounds like from some of the commenters in here, Mums is fine right now, not anticipating any shortage. And they would notify people if it looked like things were going in that direction. So, so far, so good for right now. 
That's great. Yeah. So if people are, um, I know a lot of you are on the Facebook forums and things like that. So any, any updates you get, I think would be really greatly appreciated just for other producers. Um, you know, we've covered a lot of stuff here. I, I've covered a lot of my, of, of my notes. Um, I, I think I would like to throw it out to people that are like, do people have questions uh, about uh, things in general or uh, what they could be doing more specifically uh, regarding the situation? Um, we've been very mindful about uh, not wanting to get into other topics of production. Um, I know those things are important, but we want to stay focused here. Are there questions people have that they're really unsure about uh, that, that are making them nervous, um, anything like that at all? No question. Did we cover everything that comprehensively already? <laughs> I was expecting to be here for quite a while, but uh, um, there is a good information. So what we can do, um, and 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 I'm not ending things here at all. So so if you're you're typing frantically to get it in, don't worry. Um, you can keep doing comments. Once this, uh, we've recorded this webinar, I missed the first little bit there, but most of it's here. Um, and, and the script here from the chat is here. So I can share that with people. So people can go back and look at these resources. Um, and uh, yeah, people can follow up with emails to myself or Diego where it's appropriate. Um, so Tammy's got a question here about uh, packaging and having to push into a market, uh, wasn't going to try to get to. Uh, da -da. So could you elaborate that on, on that a little bit, Tammy? I'm not sure I get uh, your context here. Do you, do you wanna, I could unmute your microphone there, Tammy. Maybe you can do that yourself. I can't remember if I gave you that, that privilege. I don't wanna unmute you unless you're ready for it. <laughs> Be like turning on your camera when you're not ready for it. Okay, so let's talk about, yeah, this is a good question. Let's talk a little bit about grocers. Um, I know people don't like um, to sell to grocers. And I think the main reason there is as, a, as, a, as when you're selling to a grocer, you are wholesaling to a grocer, which means something that you could sell for five or six dollars at the farmer's market, you're selling for two, three or four dollars to a grocer. Now, a lot of people just look at that and go, well, the economics doesn't make sense. Um, but it's not a simple calculation that's that straightforward. Um, first of all, um, you're definitely taking a price hit for sure. And as long as you're making back your cost of production plus a little bit of profit, you're coming out ahead. We, there's all, a, all, a whole bunch of different viewpoints on that in terms of production costs and whatnot. But let's just say you, if you can still make a little bit of a profit, which means everybody's being paid and the company is making a profit, um, that's a good situation. And you can do that while wholesaling things. The nice thing about grocers is they're usually pretty good volume. You're selling a lot of small units to a grocer on a regular basis. And the Food Peddlers does a number of grocers twice a week all throughout the city. Number two, you take it to the grocers, you drop it off and you walk away. There's not a lot of extra cost associated with that. Now your farmer's market has a pretty good price on your product, but when you go to the farmer's market, you're paying a fee for that stall. You're paying somebody to be at that farmer's market. Whether it's you or somebody else, there's a cost there. There's the time prepping for the market. There's the equipment you buy and maintain to be at the farmer's market. So, so you may bring in a lot of money, but there is a, a cost associated with that. And when we start taking that cost away from the price of each of those individual units, you start to see that the price of wholesale and, and the, the price of a farmer's market, they start to get a little bit closer together. Now, all this is very different at different scales and what your pricing looks like. Um, but if you're doing big production and big volume, uh, grocers can do very well. And, and, and Shauna, maybe you could it pop in the, the, um, into the conversation. That I, I can't remember, but Food Peddlers does a very big percentage of their sales to, to, to grocers. And they do very good, um, um, they, they do a lot of purchasing. Now, where we may see things, and, and this is going to vary with grocer um, 
size and policy is a lot of grocers already require you to have very, very stringent handling and hygiene message, um, uh, methods in place. Uh, some of them are actually, uh, thanks Jacob, I know you've got to head off, but thanks for your comments and joining us. Um, uh, some grocers already need you to be uh, um, like GAP certified or um, uh, need you to have HACCP procedures in place or, or something like that. So some of them already have strict regulations they want you to adhere to. And with things here, they may, um, they may try to increase some of that uh, there. You know, they may want you to increase some of your handling procedures, things like that. Uh, thanks for the comment there, Shawnee. Yeah, so 30% of the sales for the food peddlers going to grocers. And so that's around, uh, what, 30, you know, 40, $40,000 a year at least going to grocers. Uh, there's a little bit of extra liability insurance with that, um, but as a, adding that on to something isn't a big cost. Um, there are some challenges sometimes in delivering to multiple grocers, uh, but uh, as when you're selling to bigger companies, they're often, they're consistent. I was going to say they're usually bet better at paying on time, but I'm having some memories now of, of some very, very late invoices. So there's a lot of people not interested in wholesale to grocers because of the reduced price, but the volume often makes up for the price, uh, and, and that could be a big difference. Uh, grocers right now are going to stay open. Grocers need to stay open because people need food. It's always going to be an absolute. So, you know, what people don't need right now are socks and people do not need, you know, uh, reusable coffee mugs and people don't need stickers. And there's things that we can do without, but we can't do without food for very long. So um, it is something to consider, uh, though it does, it does require some analysis, which, which I don't think we can get into now, but uh, these are good questions to bring up in some of the forums. Uh, and, and we have covered this probably in some of our for, former podcasts that uh, people could search in there and look for. I can't think of them off the top of my head, so. So are, are, are there some people selling to grocers and still finding they're able to, to, to keep those deliveries up or are people seeing that they're losing um, uh, sales from grocers as well? So Sophie's saying sales are going up with grocers, which is, uh, which is great. I still, I st still don't understand why people aren't uh, buying more fresh produce and instead boy buying toilet paper, but um, there's been greater mysteries than that. Yeah, so people wanting fresh produce, which is really uh, good to think about. I think when we think about stocking up on food, we're often thinking about non-perishable stuff. So processed food, stuff in cans, pasta, flour, things like that. But obviously the fresh produce is really good, uh, which is why kind of going back to what you brought up in the beginning, Diego, like if you can't be producing for the market, um, one thing you can be doing is picking up production for yourself. Uh, you know, you could be eating more of your own product. You know, we often think about food in terms of protein and carbohydrates. Uh, but when we think about the nutrition, nutritional needs, that's something we can quite easily, uh, you know, provide ourselves very suitably with, with microgreens and, and other products like sprouts that we can do at home as well. So don't forget about, even though we're focused on business here, what you could be doing for yourself personally with home production, because you're already set up to produce this great product. So yeah, so farmers markets and restaurants closing, gro groceries going up in, in the Czech Republic. So that's good to know there. It's good to know there's some consistencies happening around the world actually, um, yeah. Yeah, good uh, points. Uh, so other, other folks doing grocers, are, are people now thinking about grocers as, as a potential market or have people tried to get into the grocer market and found it very, very difficult? So, so good question from Stephanie, like a grocer. So when I go to, uh, if I'm a grocer and somebody comes to me wanting to uh, sell me a product, I'm kind of treating that like a job interview. 
I want to know what your product is. I want to know the quality of your product. Uh, and yeah, I want to know um, what your experience is, not just as a producer, but, you know, do you have regular delivery days? What is your invoicing system? Like, you know, how are you going to deliver? Are you going to come sometimes on, on, on Tuesdays at eight in the morning and other times Wednesdays at seven at night? Um, these are all things that a lot of the grocers, especially the well-established ones, are going to think about because they're not used to buying uh, small amounts of produce from local producers. Um, most grocers are still buying from the big distributors. Um, so it, uh, we, uh, the food peddlers didn't sell to grocers for, for, we sold to one grocer for a few years, but it was many years before we really got into the grocer market. And when we tried to get in, we picked a locally owned chain, uh, which is a British Columbia chain that has four or five, maybe six locations in Vancouver. And what we did is approach them one at a time. Actually, we, we approached the purchasing manager who we had a relationship with already, uh, you know, took the product, talked about our procedures, talked about how long we'd been in business, what restaurants were selling to. Um, so we, we, we kind of sold ourselves in that regard. And I think that really helped. Um, so I think if you were to go to a grocer, maybe go to a, a one-off grocer that's locally owned, uh, that maybe carry some local stuff already, build a reputation there, and also build your procedures. You know, delivering to a grocer can be different than delivering to a to a to a, to, to somebody's house or to a restaurant. So, you, so it allows you to practice that. And then, if you later want to be selling to somebody bigger, which might end up at some point being someone like Whole Foods or Safeway or or whatever your big producer uh, grocer is. Um, going into that without any experience, without any reputation, without, without any, that would be very hard. So starting small and working your way up. Uh, okay, yeah, uh, kids going, yeah, I've, I've just got my kid on Fortnite in front of the TV with headphones on. It's great, uh, very, very appreciative. So thanks for joining us and uh, yeah, uh, for uh, keep, keep us posted online. Um, so good question about growth. So grocers are a potential new market. Um, the other thing we looked about, looked at uh, before is, is like, what about people shifting to home delivery, coming back into that? Is that an option for people to continue producing, maybe at a, at a reduced volume, which means you're going to be used to going through your seed stock a little slower? Um, is home delivery an option for some folks? Um, keeping in mind, like traffic is great these days. Um, when I do go outside, it's, it's, it's quite nice. You get to where you're going really quickly. So deliveries can be done in an efficient manner. Um, like we talked about, you're going to have to be very, very um, careful about handling. Um, so Brandon, you've mentioned you've been looking at, at home delivery. Um, have any other folks been looking uh, at that as sort of a way to, uh, to pivot the business model? And the CSA, yeah, the CSA could be a delivery model or a pickup model. I know there are people who have done a microgreen CSAs. I, I don't know that I've seen the model yet. I don't know that anybody's nailed that, but I've not really been following that. Um, I like that idea as well. Um, I'm just, um, I have my own issues about the CSA model as, as it is in a lot of places. Um, but yeah, I'd be, uh, do you see some particular challenges uh, Brandon in the home delivery and uh, what are other people looking at and Eric as well so Eric is this a shift for you into home delivery or is it something you're already doing and just going to expand okay so just starting out yeah so it seems like some yeah Right, so a lot of exploring. So Catherine, looking at pickup models. Um, yeah, if anybody wanted to comment there on, on Catherine's questions about rural pickup. I think in a rural environment, and I've had meat producers do this, you have a minimum order is one way. You know, we're going to charge X amount per delivery, but if you order over a certain amount, it's free. And you just have to say, here's the radius we're going into, or you don't guarantee it's a delivery on a certain day. Um, so you can try and cluster up people in further out regions. It's a tough one. Um, requires some, probably some math like time. 
I would think when you say cost and time prohibitive, that leads me to believe you'd have to go pretty far. So that has to be a pretty big order then to justify that or it's not worth it. So one of the models I know some of the CSA, uh, uh, rural CSA producers use here is some of their CSA customers are actually pickup points. So you would go to a, you would drive from the farm to a house in the city and 10 people pick up from that one house. So you're taking 10 orders at a time to each of your drop-off points. So that might be something that, that works a little better where you're, 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 you're doing basically deliveries of 10 and then there's a, a pickup point within the city that, in that regard. You know, one thing I've seen some restaurants do up in Northern California, I've seen some farmers post about this, and I think this would be challenging to set up, but it's an interesting idea is restaurants that can no longer take customers but are operating are producing some stuff that can be prepackaged and go into a box. So essentially a bunch of local businesses are getting together to create a CSA of stuff. Maybe that's coffee, maybe that's scones, vegetable producers are putting some stuff in there and you're getting several businesses going together. So if you had a bunch of restaurant customers, one solution might be to go to them and say, hey, could you put together some sort of takeout meal, prepackaged meal, they're moving at least something to pay the rent. And then you can put some stuff in that box with them. Uh, it's just these creative ideas that aren't guarantees, but it's what people are doing in these times. Yeah. Well, and a lot of restaurants as well, what they're doing is they're closing the restaurant, but they're shifting to takeout only. And, and I'm sure uh, in, in a lot of places that are present right now is there's a lot of delivery services now. So now we're seeing a lot of uh, the, uh, the Uber Eats drivers. We're seeing a lot of uh, 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 Skip the Dishes and, and all these other companies doing a lot more delivery. So there's still some issues there. Clearly, there's still some vector issues. But what we're getting is still the social distancing. So we're not getting groups of people uh, in, in restaurants. So what you might want to watch out for or even encourage in your area is saying to restaurants like, listen, I know you're closed down, but why don't you open up for a limited basis and just do takeout only? We're happy to continue supplying you um, with product. Um, these are conversations that you as growers should be having with distributors, with restaurants, with grocers, trying to reach out to everybody to collectively uh, start finding solutions to keep people not only fed, but like engaged and uh, still, you know, not that it, not to focus on it too much, but the better we keep the economy going, uh, the, the better we're going to weather this. Uh, I'll make a I'll make a quick uh, message uh, uh, comment here about uh, local produce. So I'm a big supporter of local production. Um, uh, local producers do not always handle their food well, uh, and this just comes from years at the farmers markets of seeing people uh, putting their food on the the the, the bed of of a like the, a dirty truck bed of moving stuff around just. Uh, not with that um, that sanitation and, and hygiene in mind. And I think there's a lot of value in keeping food production local. Um, but as I've always pushed with microgreens production, that handling and those procedures to make sure you're providing really healthy and pathogen-free food to your customers is quite important. So local food will always be important, but locally well-handled, well-managed well food is important as well. So, um, you know, the thing with the big companies is they have such a high level of accountability that they have all these procedures in place. They have all these checkpoints in place. And so they uh, it really they, they can do some of this stuff really, really well. So I think we can do it well on a local level. It's just a matter of, of, of taking some of those methods that some of the bigger companies use and employing them. It does raise our issue of accountability because there's a lot of people that the, the, the local food idea to them still means nothing. And, and if, if we can show them that we're, we're producing things well, we're providing them well, and we can do that in a really safe manner, that's gonna go a really long way to strengthening this movement after this situation passes.
Oh, some great comments there about. Uh... Oh, we got Serbia too. That's awesome. So Maximium, uh, so you you basically do you basically do home delivery there in Serbia? Is that is that how your model works? Yeah, that's that's great, and and I think there's a lot of. Can you? Uh, I don't know if there's a conversion, but what kind of production are you doing a week? Like in terms of sales, like is it is it arrogant to ask you to convert that into American dollars? Um, or maybe in terms of the number of trays you produce a week or pounds or kilograms you produce a week um, to get a sense of what that production looks like for home scale. So 40 trays a week, that's, that's not bad production just for home delivery actually, yeah. How do you run that home delivery? Do you just have a online portal, people go and they order X and then you bundle that up and you deliver it to them? And I guess a question other people in here are probably gonna be wanting to know, are you charging for delivery? Or is there a minimum order? What's the minimum order? <laughs> What's the Serbian currency? <laughs> I have no idea. Five dollars, okay. Right. Oh yeah, it's it's a tough conversion. I'm just online here. So <laughs> well here here's something interesting. For microgreens, how do you how do you sell that for home delivery? So it's not a CSA. It's foreign to some people. Do you advertise it as like a salad? How are you presenting this where enough people are gonna be interested, or is it going to like just people who are familiar with microgreens for health benefits. And I'll maybe add a comment there. So the food peddlers does home delivery as well and, and some pickups at a specific pickup spot. Uh, and definitely a lot of those people are, so for wheatgrass, it's people who are juicing wheatgrass on a regular basis. Uh, there's some regular customers that are buying, you know, four to six pounds a week over two deliveries. Uh, as, as a main part of their, um, like a, a vegan or raw food diet. So a lot of those home delivery customers are definitely people that are very mindful of the nutrition, nutrition benefits, very um, health conscious in terms of diet. Uh, I'd be curious to hear if other people are just interested in uh, uh, have customers that just like microgreens as part of their, their regular uh, mix of food as well. Yeah, so same thing, Sophie, it sounds like. I'm recalling some food peddlers customers that have been, you know, they go out of their way to make sure that, that we can get them product uh, every week. And it's, it's, it's a substantial part of their diet. And uh, I did talk with Shauna at the food peddlers about this a bit, and it's hard to know how this will play out. But for some people, the, and, and I'm sure it's the case for a few of you, like this microgreens delivery or pickup or whatever, how they're getting it is a substantial part of their diet. And it does mean a lot to them. So maybe just, uh, it, it, we can keep going. I'm just noticing, so we're at about quarter after five and, and I'm, I'm keeping time uh, unbeknownst to Diego on that cool clock just behind him there. <laughs> um, the, um, uh, if, if there's anything, again, other, other stuff that uh, people have to discuss or bring it up, please do um, any questions or anything like that. I do want to say thanks for all the input that people have given here and, 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 and hopefully you're finding value in this and just talking things through and seeing uh, what other people are going through and that sort of sense of camaraderie. Um, and I'm really hoping that this is giving some people some ideas or at least some inspiration to try something new or try that thing that you were hesitant to try. Um, and um, yeah, just kind of keep things moving and, keep people engaged you know this webinar is just a good way to pass time in the day and i've not been outside yet today and i'm getting a little restless so it's nice to be able to, to have these communications yeah i mean it, it's good to hear brandon saying you know this is giving them hope and that's what i wanted to come out of this this is 
no doubt a challenging time for millions, if not more people out there. And you can decide what to make of it with what you can control here. And a lot of businesses within the farm space I know are throwing in the towel and that's fine if that's what you want to do. But if you want to make it through, it will be hard for now. Like there is no denying that, but this will pass. It will be over. And I want people who want to survive to be in as strong of a position as possible when this is over to reestablish yourself with whatever that market looks like then. It's hard because it's so fluid and fast how everything's moving that, I mean, this could be over next week. I don't, I'm not saying that, but it could be over in three months. Do what you can now to prepare for then. And yeah, I wish you the best. I feel for you guys. Yeah, so I do feel we're kind of coming to a natural sort of closure here. You know, I, I'm happy to stay on for a few more minutes if people have other questions uh, relating to this. Um, uh, otherwise, so here now the questions come in. All right, um, but yeah, we can we can take a bit more time here, and then uh, hopefully we're seeing uh, lots of you on the forums and stuff as well. So a good uh, so Otto making a comment here about uh, yeah putting yourself at risk with with with, with delivery and whatnot. Um, it, it is difficult. Uh, I think uh, you do need to do what you feel comfortable with. Um, I know some delivery people are what they're doing is they're they're dropping off food at the doorstep, like just texting someone, letting them to know it's there. So really keeping up that social isolation. Um, I think, you know, uh, finding ways to keep yourself hygienic and sanitary in the process. But yeah, not to undermine, you know, if you're feeling uncomfortable even going outside, then uh, once again, maybe maybe this isn't the thing to do. Because I know for um, a lot of people, this this is very stressful. And, you know, we're, we're weathering it pretty well here. And I do feel in a very good position. But uh, all day long, there's an underlying sense of, of anxiety. And uh, I know a lot of people are feeling that. Yeah, so just saying Walt's comment here doing about seven hundred to a thousand dollars a month just in home delivery. So that's 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 you know as a uh, as a as a second source of income or whatever it is, uh, that's a that's a decent amount to be doing. Uh, mentioning just cash, no cash, just credit card on website. What makes these things uh, the technology we have now that's available to anybody uh, is the ability to do these things without having to have a cash transaction. You know, even 10 years ago, you'd be collecting, you'd be collecting checks or waiting for invoices or, or, or getting cash on delivery. And to know that, know that you're delivering a product that's already been um, uh, paid for actually takes some stress off. And, you know, we, we've actually had customers that were home delivery customers for, for ages and then they, they get several months behind in payment and then, then you're out several hundred dollars. So the technology allows you to manage your orders and actually manage payments in a well that might really be helpful in this, uh, in this situation as well. So thanks for sharing that, Walt. Uh, it actually seems a number of people on the webinar are quite new to things. Uh, I will say um, you've been thrown under the bus right from the beginning. Um, but what I would really hope for new producers is uh, going back to what we talked about. Um, your, your production should have this stuff uh, in consideration already. Uh, we at the Food Peddlers treat food like a high-risk product. Actually here in Canada, uh, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency treats microgreens as sprouts. And so there's a lot of procedures that need to happen. And if you're already familiar in doing those procedures, you're in a very, very good position to continue growing this product in this, this situation. I think, um, you really need to, to be super vigilant, which means really carefully following those, those procedures. 
documenting things and stepping things up. Uh, but it goes a long way towards having uh, a good consistent product and a high level of accountability uh, for, for the product you're growing and, and having the customer be assured that you're providing them with a safe product. Um, well, should we, what do you think? Should we wrap stuff up there? That seems pretty good. Yeah, thanks everybody for attending. I really appreciate it and best of luck, be safe. Yeah, thanks folks. Yeah, like I said, keep, keep us updated if you're on any Facebook forums. Uh, I'm happy to take emails. I may or may not answer them. That's just who I am. <laughs> um, but yeah, keep uh, posted. We we may look at doing another one of these in, in the near future if we, we see some need for it. Um, but I think uh, hopefully you can share what you learned today and, and please share any successes you have with us. We'd love to hear that.